Good afternoon, everyone. The banking and financial shared service, the banking uh, and financial services sector has had massive headwinds over the last few years, particularly since 2008, the, uh, the, the crisis that we all faced. Following that, the regulation has been enormous. Um, there's a, there's a, a data quote from Hackett that talks about the amount that the banks spend on compliance. This is around, for the biggest banks, around 2.8% of revenues we spend on compliance to, to, to new regulation. To give you an idea what that means, the best in class uh, in a different sector that spends on this area, we spend about 50 times the amount on this topic. So the increase in costs is dramatic. The second element of banking that's been uh, a dramatic change the last few years is the fintechs, really eating away at some of our business model and reducing our margins. So you imagine the situations banks face now is actually an increase in costs, a reduce in margins, and some real pressures in the middle. Therefore, we've had to look for some different strategies to resolve those. And the shared services topic is one of those strategies. Partly, of course, this is about cost, much less relevant these days, but partly it was in the past. It's a lot more about looking at efficient models to deliver and resolve some of these problems, creating sense of, of excellence, uh, finding new talent and new ways of resolving these problems. And these are some of the themes we'll cover today. I have been in banking for 30 years, actually my entire career. I've been in and out of the shared services area for about 14 years. So like you'll hear from many of my, my panelists, I consider myself as a banker first. And I'm very interested in this topic about how these two sectors coexist and what we can learn from this and what you can learn even if you're not in the banking sector. So now to move to my panel, what I'll ask the panel to do is say first why you're here and then give your name and rank and serial number. Start with, with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Scott Newman from State Street based in Krakow. Um, the answer to my question is that we've talked a lot about how financial services specifically has so-called gone up the complexity curve but I don't think we've really talked enough about the real examples of what that actually means and the types of jobs. Too frequently I speak with the Polish community living abroad, working in financial services, and I ask, are you thinking of coming back? And still today I quite often hear, well, no, not really, because that sector is, is pretty low low level processing type jobs. And so I think as an industry getting out there and talking about the specifics of how we've really moved um, is really important that we do today. Name? Scott Newman, State Street in Krakow, and uh, we have around uh, 5,500 uh, employees in Poland over the last 10 years, based in both Krakow and in Gdansk. So, Emmanuel, why are you here? Why are you on the panel? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here in this beautiful country and um, in front of a, such a great audience. Why am I here? I mean, I was checking the weather up last week. It was 11 degrees in London rainy and fantastic uh, sun and 33 deg degrees here, so it's a bit of a no-brainer. But on a more serious note, I'm here to represent HSBC Bank from a business perspective, as we interact with several shared service centers across the globe. I thought this would be the perfect forum to share some of my views and thoughts on the way we cooperate and we operate uh, around the globe. Uh, my name is uh, Emanuele Vignoli. I'm a manag managing director within HSBC. I'm responsible for our global cash and liquidity management uh, franchise in Europe. Thank you. Alexandra, why are you here? So my name is Alexandra Schmidt. I'm heading the service center in Krakow of HSBC. I'm here today to join, first of all, Scott in the conversations about in which way the service centers have changed. And I'm here to join then um, Evie as well and, um, and the others here in the panel of having a conversation about how much we are friends right now and how much the bank and the service centers need each other. So, um, and I'm really looking forward to get some, some really interesting questions, hopefully, as well. Julian, you know the score? Yeah, hello there. I, I, I'm bringing one of the largest asset managers uh, globally to, to Poland. Um, with, uh, with the company I work for. So when we talk about moving up the complexity curve, we're bringing about 14 different business areas, starting from scratch in December. And uh, I'm very keen to share that journey with you so far, and also to learn from the other panelists um, about uh, their journeys as well. 
And last but not least, I'm not sure we need to introduce you, but please go ahead. Good, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as we don't have a re reverse uh, speaker, uh, I, I'm not sure if I can understand your question, but that doesn't uh, mean anything for me because I, it's ev even easier for me to, to say what I would like to, to say, regardless of the, the question. So, but probably, uh, if I understand my uh, previous speaker uh, answer, uh, you ask uh, why I'm here, and th this is a s simple answer for me. Uh, probably it's due to the fact that I'm still alive, even though I'm the, the senior prime minister, which means the... <laughs> which means that my predecessor, unfortunately, is already in the heavens and is watching us right now, and also my successor. Uh, went in the same direction. I'm not 100% sure if he went straight to heaven or maybe it's uh, some clearance uh, necessary. Uh, there are two more to, to go, so I feel quite comfortable. Mm -hmm. But let me be very also precise. Uh, I've heard that Marek Belka is coming to the next panel. Marek Belka used to be a prime minister 2004, so something like uh, 13 years later. And he's still alive in a good shape. Uh, so pr probably he could say something more interesting. Uh, there too, in, maybe in the opening, uh, I, I would like to, to stress one maybe uh, information. Uh, I chaired uh, a panel of top eight Polish banks at the uh, European Financial Congress, which was held in Sopot less than two weeks ago. And for the first time, because we Poles, we don't like to, uh, uh, to speak with the unified way. For the first time, all top uh, eight banks were actually uh, fully uh, agreed upon main conclusion, and also all of them were concerned. So why were they concerned? The reason of concern is simple. The, the banks work for the profit. Uh, for the bank, nice profit is uh, ROE double digits. Today in Poland, the, the top banks could reach maybe 7% of uh, ROE. And the profitability is declining. At the same time, the, the cost of uh, regulatory compliance is growing. Uh, I remember during the rehearsal, we discussed it on the phone, and you spoke about seven, eight billion of uh, compliance cost in the UK, but the, the, the British uh, banking sector, I think, is 20 times bigger by assets than, than the Polish. At, and the, at the same time, we have the regulatory cost uh, measured by the Polish Banking Association, something like, uh, uh, Two billion euro, so it's, it's, it's really a lot, and and the, the 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 CEOs are really concerned that they would not have enough money for the development, for the new technology and so on, so so they are concerned. Okay, if they are concerned, I, maybe you are also a little bit concerned. Yes, I, I you know that I can continue for a minimum two hours because I'm not well prepared. <laughs> so you have to stop me. I think we set the standard very well, actually. <laughs> Good, thank you. So thank you all for taking on the challenge to introduce yourself. I'm not sure if it's really clear for you, so we have two colleagues from one bank sitting far away. I'm not sure if that's a sign, actually. And then we have two colleagues from another bank sitting here in the middle. And the objective here is to look at how the relationship works with some of these with a challenger over in the corner. So let's move on to the first theme. We've got three themes we want to cover, and the first theme we're going to cover now is we've been in many conferences. You know, We've been doing this for years. You've all seen it. We've all talked about going up the value chain because the lower end is moving out or being automated. Um, I think, and certainly the center I ran and the center we have in Poland, we're already there. We've been there for years. We're doing complex activities already. And whenever we have guests come in from abroad, they're normally pretty astonished when they see the kinds of activities we do. This is not just the mess for less. This is something actually quite interesting. Um, and what I want to do today is, is just to start off with, if each of you can give real examples, not complex ones no one understands, real examples of the kinds of things that get delivered here, either you do 
and you receive, or you do and you receive, that actually brings it to life uh, for people. And maybe they can use it in their other examples when they're selling their services, let's say, to their, to their parent. So in the case of State Street, um, over the last 10 years, more than 90% of all of our European business is now de de uh, de delivered out of Poland. And so where else is better to drive the change that we as an industry are, are going through? So the shift in our case has been from a support location to actually asking Poland to tell the rest of the organization what to do. Five years ago, we started to receive questions from employees and from you know, other stakeholders well, you're very big now within the State Street family in terms of asset servicing, custody bank. Could you ever do asset management out of Poland? And I thought, well, I'd, I'd love to, but I'm not sure there's really going to be appetite across the rest of the bank to think that we could actually do portfolio management out of Poland for our international client base. And so Julian will speak in more detail, but to now have our global advisors asset management arm based in Krakow doing investment management for the global client base out of Poland has sort of been the, the icing on the cake for us at State Street. And now that we touch every area of, of State Street from Poland. A um, couple of other quick examples I would say is as we win new business now anywhere in the world, it's no longer onboarded into the bank um, in the UK or in the US or Ireland or Luxembourg, come straight to Poland, where the expertise is. Um, Derek talked about the regulatory environment and how that appears to be changing every day. Um, a lot of new products have come out of that over the last few years. And one example is the way that as an investor buying a mutual fund, historically, depending on which fund company you have gone to, you have received a lot of different information, brochures, prospectus, very difficult to interpret in an inconsistent way. And a few years ago, the European regulatory landscape came together and said, we're going to standardize and create one document, a key information document. That product for State Street was developed in Poland. So the reality is today, the same jobs are being done here as in any other global hub, global financial center within State Street. Very good example. Maybe over to you, Julian, uh, on the other side of the uh, State Street family. Yeah, just expand a little bit on that. So within State Street Global Advisors, that's one of the largest asset managers globally. We manage 2.8 trillion. And so most of our other operations are in what I would refer to as traditional investment centers, places like Boston, uh, London, Singapore, um, Hong Kong, places like that. And so the reason I find this really interesting is that I've been building um, investment teams and working for asset managers for over 20 years now. And the best teams that are formed are where you get challenge to the norm, uh, cognitive diversity. And that's what really excites me about Poland because here we've already got, um, as I said, 14 different areas that we're building within global advisors, but those actually include five front office investment teams. And so we've actually got, uh, whether it's in the quant areas, quant, quant equity, um, various fixed income equities, um, and also in, in the strategy areas. We've also got a whole range of um, research areas uh, supporting our global ETF business. So these aren't um, minor roles. These are the center and the real core of what we as an asset manager do. So I think it's a fascinating time to be here in Poland. Um, and what's really exciting is, is the fact that we're actually building these teams here as extensions to the global model. So this isn't a case of, oh, it's a separate little entity that exists over in Poland. This is actually part of the, the, the core of the asset management uh, company that I work for um, and um, is going to be at the cutting edge of innovation and change within that company. Thank you. Maybe uh, from your London base, what kind of activities are you getting here that, um, that would confound the audience, let's say? Yes, I mean, uh, from an HSBC perspective, uh, I see our relationship, I'm talking from a business side, and Alex can share our views, but from a business perspective, I see this as a true partnership approach, so we are really complementary to each other. There are various factors that contribute to this success, but I kind of pick three just to give you an idea of what I feel is one is really close to my heart and I think really works well. I mean, the first thing is around consistency. HSBC is a global bank. We deal with global uh, clients, and they, they expect consistency in the service they receive. And by having a global, a regional hub here in Krakow, that's what we're able to do. So we are able to service global clients in a consistent manner, which is a great value added. 
The second one, more from an operational perspective, I'll give you an example. I mean, we always talk about contingency, but a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe a month ago, we had one, hour, one of our main sites infrastructure in Europe, and we'll say which country, collapsed completely. By, basically, they were unable to process any payments or to service our clients. So the, the, the service of excellence here in Krakow to cover not only performed all the activities on top of their day-to-day uh, -day job, but they also received uh, very strong accolades and compliments from not only from the internal stakeholders, but from, uh, from the clients, which was a great achievement. The third one, which I will share, is around um, capacity. I mean, uh, having the ability of having such a strong uh, center servicing our clients allow us to release capacity on short to basically focus on more sales activities. So we want our front office people to be out to see clients uh, on the ground in a country level. And uh, this model works so well and gives us the ability to do so. So in, um, in summary, HSBC is really growing their franchise uh, and uh, presence in Europe uh, and the CEO in Krakow, the center of excellence, is really an integral part of this story. Thank you. I mean, these stories are very powerful. You can and should use these. And what you can and should do, and we've done in the past, is you, know, you just share the stories with your colleagues. Other bankers come, they hear the stories, and it really drives the sector and shows what we can deliver here. Now let's move on to the second theme. This gets a bit more difficult, so I'm going to pass the question to you, Alexandra. So, of course, this has been a long journey. It's clearly been bumpy. There's some things that didn't go well. What are the lessons that we've learned over that period that we can give advice to? Let's say maybe some things that didn't work out very well, you stopped doing, or you changed the approach. Is there some color you can give that people in the audience can learn the, um, to avoid the same pitfalls? I think some, uh, some things that we found out um, uh, had to be changed is um, something around what I would call accountability um, for the teams in Krakow. So what has changed? And I think that um, most of you can probably agree that we all had to prove in the service centers how capable we are um, compared to the onshore teams, right? So, and we had to prove it for several years. And then after a while, actually the approach in HSBC, um, which was taken from, from the global headquarter was actually um, that we will call the services that we are providing, specifically in operations, managed services. Managed means the whole risk, all the failures, everything, belongs to us in Krakow, and not any longer to the in-country team, right? So we are responsible for what we are doing. We are responsible for what we are driving forward. We are responsible for implementing change. So, and I think that this was a mind shift that had to, um, had to come from the global headquarter, and we got a lot of support, um, specifically um, from the UK um, as well. I think that um, we all can be, if you ask me, and I will phrase it like this right now, I think we all can be a little bit more bold. Because what we are doing out of Poland is just something, I mean, show it, show it at any other country in Europe delivering at this scale, right? And I think that we as the, the, the community of the service centers have to be a little bit more bold. Our people, our employees have the right to talk about what they are doing, and they are actually right now the workforce of the future. A lot of changes are not any longer happening in country. They are happening where we are, in Krakow, in Warsaw, in Gdansk, in, in, in Roslov, whatever. So I think that um, this is something what I would strongly recommend to show um, to others as well. Can I pick up on one theme uh, before I go to you? Just, just the, you mentioned the, the naming, the, the managed service concept. This has, for my organization, been a talking point for the last 15 years. What do we call these things? We think of them as just part of the bank, another office, but we quite often brand them as shared service centers, GBS centers, sometimes even something else completely different that has no relation to the brand. What's the perspective any of you had? Actually, maybe, Scott, what, what, have you had a, a change in your organization on that, that front? 
Yeah, we've gone through about every naming convention you can probably imagine, but I think most, most recently uh, being part of our, our international bank as a branch of a, a regulated bank license, um, we are perceived as the, the same as anywhere else around um, the organization. Having said that, I think you know, increasingly due to some of the, you know, the challenges externally, the macro environment, the fee environment, we no longer have the luxury whereby we can continue to grow in, in Poland just to create capacity for growth. It's becoming more difficult as we grow in Poland and what that means for the other locations that we service. And I think we need to be sensitive to that uh, going forward. And I would just pick up and echo what Alexandra said in terms of being bold. My experience here in Poland is it, the work ethic is, is second to none. It's incredibly strong but we are not good at getting out there talking about the work we're doing and, and the good work that we're doing. And we need to do that more, whether it's from a branding perspective, internal marketing, and getting that buy-in and that trust from headquarters. Exactly. Emmanuel, you wanted to add? You know, Derek, it's just one of the things that Alex said around accountability that kind of uh, made me think, I mean, clearly accountability works both ways. So one of the things that um, I felt as a challenge, you were talking about challenges in the past, not just here in Poland, uh, but globally for us was around staff attrition and engagement. And clearly when you work with a remote site, you need to have some rules of engagement. And something that I think uh, worked very well is to establish these so-called rules of engagement. So I'll just mention a few that I think uh, is worth uh, sharing. I mean, the first one is around uh, uh, common goals. I think it's very important that all sites work towards the same object objectives. The second one is around strategy. Again, uh, there is to be an alignment and a clear understanding of the wider group strategy at both sides, and it's something that we always do. The third one is around career path. We talk about extremely talented people that are working in the center of excellence, and what we're trying to promote is uh, either short-term assignment or even move into the, into the business in other countries. So we're trying to promote a lot of this that really gives uh, a career path to uh, the people working in a shared service center. And the final one, I mean, the, the, the way they have approached it, I mean, uh, setting up a, a center of excellence or working with one is not a one-off exercise. You just don't open the door and then throw away the keys. It's a continuous engagement. You need to have visit, you need to have training, you have to be working together all the time and ensure that it's almost an extension of the same team. And I mean, if you follow this principle, then it really works well and delivers the value for the clients. Ultimately, we're here to service the client, and that's uh, what we need to think about. Thank you. Maybe, Julian, let's say just over to you. I mean, you've been on the other side for a number of years. How long were you on the other side of State Street before you moved here? Um, well, I was in London with State Street for about three years, but I've been in asset management for about 24. So from your perspective, what is it that gets done in these centers that gives you the confidence to say, you know what, I'm, I know they can do the work. What, what are the kinds of things that can help, do you think? So I think, having, the first of all, having a really, really clear vision of what you're, what you're, at, what you're going to achieve. Um, I think that's, that's one, the, the starting point. Senior sponsorship from, from the organization. And what's also really helped is actually having the, 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 the banking part of, of State Street here already, which has been massively, massively positive. I think another key, key thing to remember is to re, don't just take bits of processes, take whole processes, be bold about what we're actually going to do here. Um, and also don't to seek to replicate what you've been doing traditionally. The thing about asset management, is that it, which interests me, is that it continually evolves and changes as a function of time. So use opening up new centers as an opportunity to re-engineer, streamline, and, and, and alter and move forward. Um, and I think that's, that's already, we've only been here a very short period of time, but um, where we're forming these teams and we're getting people from different backgrounds, looking at processes, the fact they're actually bringing innovation and saying, can't we use technology more? Can't we do things in a different way? We can, and so it's not a case of, as another chain in, a longer, in an ever-increasingly longer process, we can actually perhaps put a number of different pieces together and just change quite significantly the way we're doing things. And I think that's a big opportunity. So I'd echo that point about being bold. Okay. Thank you. I think there's some common themes about being bold. A few of you have mentioned also the talent, of course. I mean, that's why we're all here. The quality of people is, is astonishing. Uh, and, and again, in our firm, we've seen the ability to hire people here is, is a lot easier than some of our big, let's say, um, uh, um, other locations where the war for talent is quite high. But maybe, Yang Chushov, you can comment. You've seen this sector grow over the last 10 plus years. What's your perspective in terms of the talent and the quality of people that we've grown in this business? 
Thank you. Yes, I, I do remember uh, probably the first uh, ABSL uh, meeting uh, held um, something like 10 years ago. And with the great uh, satisfaction, they, they spoke at that time about, uh, I think, uh, 40,000 or 50,000 people uh, employed in the sector, and they spoke about, uh, with the optimism, about the future and so on. Um, so at that time, everybody expected uh, that sector to, to sort out one of the greatest challenges uh, facing Poland uh, 10 or 12 years ago, which was the uh, jobs for the young graduates. Because uh, Poland, uh, the, with the youngest population in Europe um, 20 years ago, more or less, uh, had a massive young population. Uh, and uh, contrary even to Germany, uh, 50% of them decided to go to the university. So you had enormous flow, higher than in Germany, of the young graduates. And the, that sector, um, business services, was a fantastic opportunity for, for them to find, find the job. So at that time, we were all delighted that the uh, business services are coming, the new jobs are created, as you kindly expressed, uh, uh, the, the jobs are more and more sophisticated from basic services uh, regarding accounting. Now they move to, as you said, uh, center of excellence, almost research and so on. But frankly speaking, I'm, uh, the more I hear about it, uh, the more I uh, uh, become uh, less enthusiastic about it. Uh, <laughs> let me explain why. Because in the beginning, everybody was happy that the, the new jobs are uh, offered to the young uh, graduates. Today, uh, in the days of uh, war for talent and uh, uh, GBS, which is uh, uh, the hothouse for talent and everybody looking for talent, I'm a little bit concerned where the Polish talent w w will go. And, uh, because so many of them, when they got into the uh, international uh, or global company, they get into the network and they r sometimes rotate, but they stay within the uh, organization. So the more you come with the be better opportunities for, for the young, the more talent is, um, I would not say drained because it would not be nice to say drain, but the, the more talent uh, uh, is really uh, caught uh, by interesting job opportunities and is even the, the more and more difficult therefore for the brick and mortar uh, financial service in, in Poland to compete. Uh, not forget about the fintech also knocking on the Polish doors and so. Uh, so the competition for talent is, is, is now so much changed that from enthusiasm about the uh, quickly growing sector of business services, I'm, as I said before, a little bit, little bit concerned that you grab the best people and who will left out, uh, for example, for the Polish politics. No, no, this is not, this is not even a joke. Uh, no, no, nobody will, uh, nobody will uh, be left out. But who will be uh, available for, for the interesting Polish companies and, and particularly for the Polish entrepreneurs who also need uh, excellent centers, uh, some research centers. Now they invest more and more into that kind of services because uh, 20 years ago, not a single Polish entrepreneur invested into uh, R&D. Today, they try to do but then they need the talent. And you also come and look for, for the best uh, of the best. So from enthusiasm, I I'm, would like to express a small concern. So maybe you can a little bit dilute my... Uh... Yeah, I'm just going to open to the panel, actually. Can I yeah, yeah. No, take I'll, up the challenge? Come on. I'll have a go at that. Um, I would say at the moment, um, I don't see it. And, and I say it for a couple of reasons. I remember coming to these conferences and speaking in the regional industry groups around saturation, talent wars becoming more difficult. Um, 
We're hiring more people this year in Poland than we have hired in the 11 years that we've been here, around 1,300 people. And we're on track to do it. And yes, it's, there's some challenges, but I'm pretty comfortable that we can do it. Now, longer term, when you look at some of the demographic trends and less people attending university, I see the, the danger. At the same time, though, I think collectively as a sector, we are working to expand our outreach and tap into more non-traditional talent pools. So we've all gone after graduates, as you describe. I think you know one can't ignore the metric on the increase in foreigners coming to Poland, not just because we are going out there looking for them, but more are seeing the opportunities here. Believe me, if you're sitting in a London office in financial services at the moment, and don't get me onto Brexit, but if you're sitting in Germany or Italy, the outlook is not so positive. And we have seen, for example, a huge increase in the number of Indian nationals coming to Poland. And in fact, we've hired over 100 in the first few months of the year. And I met a group of them and I just said, help me understand. It's not, you know, we haven't experienced this before. Is there a new agreement with the government? What is driving it? And they said to me, no, we are ambitious. We're educated. We see the growth going in, in Poland and we want to take uh, that opportunity and get that experience. Um, increasingly, we're targeting Polish community that has been working in financial services living outside of Poland. To my earlier point, we have to continue to educate them. So we are diversifying that pool to make sure that we are planning for the future. But as of now, yes, some competition, but we are still able to hire in line with our targets broadly. Is that, yeah, did that help your little concern? Just, just one question, because I've got a 27-page paper written by the EY uh, global, so I, I'm not going to read you because we uh, we couldn't stop until the uh, late evening. But uh, they 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 ro uh, wrote one interesting uh, uh, point regarding uh, people. People are still a valuable resource, and they say uh, this is a, a redesigning career path, rotational trainee programs, uh, uh, which might be the partial solution. What, what do you make of these rotational programs? Because that would broaden the perspective and maybe uh, give them more uh, insight about the global economy, not just the, uh, staying here, being trained here, and using Donald Trump expression. Yeah, how he's, you, you must have been a hard to work for when you were prime minister. It's like very challenging uh, <laughs> questions. <laughs> but it's, um, I, I mentioned it before, I mean, very good, very good point, both of them. On the, on the career path, I mean, I totally agree. And HSBC is doing this rotation. Uh, we have now embedded in our onboarding process. So we've got people from Alex's team that now are part of my team in the business in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in Ireland, in other teams, and vice versa. So we want to do this uh, as part of the of the day-to-day -day onboarding process. So it's something that has to happen, because otherwise, the only development is basically moving to another bank or to another shared service center for a bit more money, which is not what we want. We want people here in Poland to be able to grow within the same organization or outside Poland okay. if, they, if they want to, you know, to experience some experiences abroad. But cross-training across the organization is definitely a must. I don't know if you want to add anything, Alex. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, just about the, um, the, the, road, the transfer of knowledge. And um, uh, I think there's some really good points about uh, well, when I came out here to talk about the talent pool within Poland, and so um, originally I'm a physicist, so I like to look at the, the data to actually see if there is. And so I, I, the, the confirmation I would have is that there's some very, very skilled people here, some very hard-working people here, but sometimes we don't, it, there isn't a developed financial services center in asset management. So what, what we've actually seen in terms of the roles that we're bringing here is actually a rotation of talent back into Poland from Polish people who have gone to London and got experience who are now coming back. And so I think that, that, that's quite an interesting rotation. And I think the other thing is the fact that um, organizations such as ours are bringing this kind of, these kind of roles here is that, that what, that's, what we're do, doing is bringing the transferable skills from the Polish population, but what we're then also doing is putting them as part of global teams. So there's actually a massive transfer of knowledge and also skills into the country. And so that in itself is actually very generative in terms of the industries that can, uh, can, can then flourish within this country. Alexandra, a short, robust comment as well? Yeah, I think um, if, if we are talking about rotation, I think that um, we are narrowing ourselves a little bit with regards to uh, what means talent and what is the skill set for 
which we are looking, right? Because if we are talking, for example, for, I just can talk about HSBC and our service center, right? I'm looking for a talent with regards to a special kind of soft skill. I'm looking for a talent with a special kind of technical skill for IT. I'm looking for a talent with analytical skills for one of the risk analytic teams. And I'm looking for someone with a financial background um, as well. So there is a variety already within the service centers, and that what was already mentioned. Um, we are trying to to send our people across the world. Let's say it like this. Because what we need is actually we need to have this kind of reflection. What worked somewhere else a little bit better? And this is what we are doing. And if I can probably calm down a little bit the concerns, you can't imagine how many requests we right now are receiving due to Brexit. I have to use the B word. People who went six years ago, young people to London and want to move back to London, uh, uh, want to move back to, to uh, Poland. I think Poland doesn't have to be concerned with regards to the talent pool, because with so many graduates, right, and such a, vari a variety on the market, we are not stealing the talents from the, the industry. I don't think so. I think that we, we are in a good partnership. <laughs> well, uh, partnership is a beautiful expression. I know it from EY. Uh, it's, it's exactly the partnership. So, <laughs> so <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay, but I, I'm not speaking about stealing. No, no. Well, I'm I'm I'm, I'm speaking about uh, comp competition because the, the more automation we have, the more talent is needed. Actually. So it goes in the opposite direction, yes? So, because today we are excited about some basic robots who, who does this five times faster than the accountant, but this, this is a well, uh, basic job. Uh, but the more automation we introduce to the accounting, the more, uh, uh, the less is left for really and the brightest uh, minds. And that's why the, the competition is so difficult because I observe it uh, in my everyday life when I brought a group of uh, young, uh, great people uh, in the uh, uh, prediction modeling. Uh, we were so advanced that, in, in fact, in consulting, nobody could uh, uh, find them uh, uh, a good job with the quick uh, return. So they were grabbed by, by, the, by the Germans. Uh, who couldn't believe that the, in Poland the predictive modeling is so much developed. So what I'm saying, even the international consultant at that stage, four years ago, was not able to, uh, to find an interesting um, uh, project uh, regarding uh, predictive uh, uh, modeling, which you can use also in the manufacturing, because it, it's better than, um, than the traditional aut automation, uh, so, so, so really uh, um, the second, uh, I'm not going to say second concern, is that uh, for, for the, the brightest, you need really uh, jobs at the highest level of um, sof sophistication, yes? That's, that's another problem, so it, it's not only concerned that the, the, the best could uh, uh, outflow, but also that you have to bring to Poland jobs uh, satisfactory to those uh, uh, who are so great in uh, neuron uh, uh, networks and uh, that really uh, uh, jobs important for the uh, AI uh, being introduced. So how to get the best jobs into the really sophisticated center of excellence? Because, well, uh, as I said, I don't give the name of the, the German institution, but they couldn't believe that in Poland they could do it because the Germans always have the same answer. No, you can't do this because we don't do it in Germany. So it's, it's simple. So it's in English that you can do what I can't do, you know. So. The issue Sorry. that I have right now, right? I'm already on the hot seat with regards to the talents, and now, as a German, right, <laughs> it's not getting better for me. So, <laughs> uh, 
but... <laughs> yeah, one minute for a robust, <laughs> short answer. But I think, um, so a concern that, so let's call it concern that I'm sharing as well, is that our industry is changing so fast right now that the talent of today is probably not the talent of tomorrow and it's difficult to define what is the talent of tomorrow. So I would agree completely with regards to this. And um, I think that um, from, from a group rev, uh, level, what, what I can share is that we came up with some examples in IT and in the analytic teams, exactly the same example that you brought with this German company. I think that we have proved that we have talents already within our organization who can come up with these um, really fancy solutions, right? And um, it is happening here in Poland, and we as HSBC are selling it actually globally, right? So, and, and I think this is also the good news about the changing environment in which we are. Thank you, Alexandra. Being, uh, being a German is not a big problem, you know. Uh, <laughs> we have a... We have a Donald Tusk, who is half German. Uh, my my grand, grandmother was German. So, but the, but the, but your 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 trust is a little bit limited because, uh, but uh, it's sometimes very good for Poland because uh, uh, my great colleague, uh, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, uh, worked for the company, small company. Uh, and small insurance company in Poland, and try to sell to the to the parent company in Germany uh, uh, solution how to sell uh, uh, insurance product uh, via internet. And he contacted the headquarters of the very famous German firm, and the German answer was no, impossible. We don't do it uh, through internet. So you can't have this product uh, um, in Poland. So he came to, to, to Germany. They learned that, um, OK, that this is possible, but maybe it's too early. So he said, they said to him, advise him to, to go back to Poland, which was actually the best ever uh, decision or um, solution uh, he, uh, he faced in his life. Because thanks to this attitude, he went back to Poland, established a company, something like uh, 600 million zloty, uh, not, not best uh, software house, and he's doing well, you know. And later, or sooner or later, also in the German big insurer, also managed to, to sell products via internet, so it's not that bad. So everybody's happy. Great. So, on that we, note, on that very positive note, we'll try and wrap this. Now, to close, a lot of people in the audience want to take something away with them. We've all learned, we've got to this point, we're delivering complex services, we saw how hard it was to get there, be bold, show engagement, make sure talent's developed, trained and turned around. Imagine you are in a lift, each of you, it's going down, and a member of middle management from a shared service center gets in with you. What's the one thing you tell them they should do? And it's a short lift, it's not the Warsaw Spire, it's not a very long lift, it's a very short lift. Start with you, Julian. What's the one thing you say that someone here can take away with them on Monday? I think be bold, innovate, use technology, and change processes. Thank you. Alexandra? On top of that, stay interested, um, speak up. Act as a partner, understand the wider strategy, and uh, engage. Scott? You're great in the, the hard skills. Your people are great with the hard skills. In, invest more and more and don't un underestimate the soft skills. Thank you. And Jan Christoph, if one of these gets into a lift with you, what's the one thing you'll say to them? Thank you very much for the panel. It was really a pleasure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.